Today I will ask the question, can we fix the world? And I believe, yes, we can. And I will explain you how to build our smart digital society. Today, when we want to change the world to the better, there are a lot of obstacles in the way. There are a lot of regulations that are difficult to take into account. And basically, that restricts us a lot in what we can do. At the same time, all of these regulations are pretty costly. So most industrialized countries in the world have a high level of debt, and the question is how should we pay for all this in the future? So somehow it becomes clear we need a new approach, but which one? The problems of the world are complex. We are faced with societal problems such as crime, conflict, war, and financial crisis. Now, some people have proposed big data would fix our problems. Chris Anderson, for example, proposed that we would see the end of theory. The data deluge, he says, makes the scientific method obsolete. So is big data the universal tool to understand and govern the world in the future? Who thinks so? Nobody? That's interesting. Well, it seems like pretty soon we can know everything about this world. And so some people would ask, can we build something like a crystal ball, an information system that would tell us what's going on in the world in any place, in real time, and would even allow us perhaps to predict the future? If we had all this information, would we be able to take perfect decisions? You know, could we govern the world like a wise king? That's the question. But knowing things certainly is not enough. We would need to have power to change the world. But people say knowledge is power. So might be if we know everything, we could do everything. Could we build almighty? And that's a question that would require the ability to change people's behaviors and decisions. And in fact, information systems might be able to do that. With personalized information, we might manipulate people's choices. And this is probably not just a theoretical scenario because we are faced with a digital revolution. And this implies that within about 10 years time, some people think it's five years, other people think it's 25, computers will reach brain power. So we'll be able to compete with basically all of our skills. They will be able to do every single task better than humans can do. And in fact, robots become more and more capable and sophisticated. They can learn. They may soon multiply and evolve without our help. That means they will be able to build other robots and even better robots. So, you know, they will be eventually superior to humans. And already, intelligent machines are better than the best chess players in the world. They're better at answering questions, they're winning game shows, they're better workers, they will be better drivers, and they may be better doctors too. That means everything that can be done based on routines, on standardized knowledge, machines will be able to do better than humans. So intelligent machines will start to be our tools and then they will be our partners or colleagues as they grow more intelligent. Then if they overtake, they will be our coaches and tell us you know, how we should behave, what we should do to be successful and eventually they might be our bosses. And suddenly everyone is talking about Skynet. 
you know, a globe-spanning intelligent system that would be super intelligent and would take decisions by itself. So the question is, could we be remotely controlled in the future? Or is this already happening? Because actually, we are looking into our smartphones all the time. Maybe we are already manipulated in what we are doing. And that seems to become an interesting tool for politics too. It's called nudging or soft paternalism. And it would make people do what the government thinks is best for the country. And so we would basically be hypnotized by all these messages that are sent to us. They would tell us what to do. Now, would that be good? I'm not entirely sure because we already see some side effects of personalized information systems, such as the filter bubble. Ellie Pariser has written a book about it. And it turns out that now Republicans and Democrats have increasing problems talking to each other and finding good political compromises that would be good for the country because if they're talking about the same subject, such as health insurance, for example, or any other subject, they would talk about this with different words, with different concepts, because they're not anymore confronted with a different kind of thinking. They can't talk to each other anymore. And in fact, if we influence people's choices, <coughs> we know from this PNAS paper that it could undermine the wisdom of crowds, which is underlying the functioning of stock markets, for example, or democracies. So it could happen that basically the outcome would be worse. For the wisdom of crowds to work well, it's important that everyone would collect information independently and take decisions independently, and then we aggregate. So if we influence this information gathering process and the decision-making process, the entire system might get biased, and we might not even know what is the status of the system. This is kind of the issue. Then the other issue is, would super intelligences get out of control? You know, once they're two times more intelligent, maybe not. You know, we have learned to ride horses and elephants. Uh, would we be able to ride dinosaurs, you know, 10 times or 20 times bigger than us? So if they get too intelligent, wouldn't they emancipate themselves? Wouldn't they start doing what they think is the right thing to do, which might be different from what we think is the right thing to do. And so many people who really know about technology in detail are getting concerned about artificial intelligence. Elon Musk, for example, said, I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. If I had to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. So we need to be very careful. Stephen Hawkins too said, humans who are limited by slow biological evolution couldn't compete and would be superseded. And Bill Gates said, I'm in the camp that's concerned about superintelligence. And finally, Steve Wozniak, who was a co-founder of Apple said, Computers are going to take over from humans, no question. But will we be gods? Will we be family pets? Or will we be ants that get stepped on? I don't know. Besides powerful you, the tools will enable serious misuse. And what we see is that cybercrime is exploding exponentially. So there are increasing threats our critical infrastructures are becoming vulnerable. And it's also very costly because this costs $3 trillion each year. Now, how much would it cost in 10 years' time? We know that 
many big companies have been hacked and also the US military, the Pentagon and so on. So at the last World Economic Forum, somebody said there are companies who have been hacked and those who don't know yet. So it seems that there is no information system that's absolutely secure. And so we need to con be concerned about it because powerful systems would attract organized criminals, they would attract terrorists, they would attract extremists. So sooner or later they might get access and this is what we need to be worried about. So without suitable safety precautions, information technology can be dangerous for everyone, for citizens, businesses, and politics. And this applies in particular to the implications of the technological revolution that we're now seeing, the digital revolution. So experts expect that about 50% of people will lose their jobs in industry and in the service sector in the next 10 to 20 years. That's every second of us. But also companies will face threats. 40% of today's top 500 companies will be gone in the next 10 years. And it could also happen that we slip into a totalitarian society and why is that bad? Because these systems usually get into situations that would let them engage in wars sooner or later. And the reason for this is, uh, from my point of view, a collapse of socioeconomic diversity. And we'll come back to the importance of diversity for success later on. So this is the problem. Now, we need to avoid this scenario of the World War III. As Albert Einstein said, I don't know what weapons World War III will be fought with, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Besides the big data approach, the crystal ball and the magic wand won't work well. You could think that, you know, if we know everything about what every single person does, we could predict the future. In fact, now there are companies like uh, Recorded Future who are pretty good at predicting people's behavior. Now, research suggests that our behavior can be predicted in more than 90% of cases. So you would think, okay, that makes the world predictable. But if you want to simulate people, <coughs> so the simulated agents would never get more similar than identical twins. Yeah, And we know that identical twins are very similar, but they're not identical. And the question is, how much does it matter if our prediction is wrong in 5% of cases. And actually, we have made an experiment in a laboratory that answers this question. So, we had a, a setting with two types of people, <coughs> and it turned out that their decisions could be predicted with a precision of 96%. So it's a very accurate micro-model. However, this micro model couldn't predict the macro outcome. So, this is the typical experimental outcome. This is what the model predicts that has 96% accuracy. So, it predicts something very different. And that depends on the kind of situation. We are here seeing a situation where just two deviations from the initial state would lead to a completely different outcome. So basically we see a cascade effect, small perturbations would destabilize, this is, or this is an unstable system in fact, so that's why small changes, very small changes would lead to completely different outcomes. 
So we'll come back to this issue of instability later on. So, in fact, since you use a, a microscopic uh, process, it's a kind of agent together? Uh, it's an it's a, agent based it's a model. It's a bit uh, counterintuitive because if you correctly uh, model the microscopic type, 96%, but how, why? So, the outcome of the macroscopic tense is not. Because it's uh, an unstable system. And I will show you more examples for this. So in fact, since you use a uh, correct in microscopic way. Yes. So, so that is my question. So 96%, you say 96% so the microscopic level. Yes, on the microscopic right. level. So in fact, since uh, microscopic. Uh, no, that, that we can predict 96% of all individual decisions. Individual decision. Yes. But after you tell the other decision of those agents, right. you fail to predict, you mean? No, it's just that the 4% can change everything. Oh, I see. Oh. And that, let me give you an example. Now, assume we would know everything about you and everything about you. And now it happens that you meet each other and start to talk to each other and there is an interaction and we know that this can change your life and if you're influential it could be changing the situation of the entire world like think of Caesar and Cleopatra falling in love with each other and now that had implications for the entire world okay. so you said that four uh, percent is enough to Unstabilized uh, system. Even 1% and even 0.1% and even 0.01% would be enough. So it is a natural, natural it's, a, it's, a, it's a nature of the uh, social system. It's the nature of social really? systems, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's a big part or just a, just a uh, prediction by theory? Or this uh, is an experiment. Just an experiment. So it's in empirical? Yes. Uh, we have done a lot of experiments to look oh, into this. Yeah? But it's not here. Yeah. How many are subject there? Uh, as many as you can see over here. Uh, yeah. I mean, the total subject, how many did you have? Oh, I have to look it up. Okay. Yeah. But I will show you some other examples. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, the point is, what we will do now is we'll add noise to this 96% perfect model. And we will think noise makes this model worse. But it turns out, actually, it increases the predictive power of the model. So now it can predict much better the macroscopic outcome because it takes into account the feature of these deviations and what's the impact of these deviations, right? However, if we think that adding noise would do the job for us and now we can predict the world, again, this is wrong because we're not just behaving in random ways now uh, to some extent, but deviations from kind of the average behavior could be strategic could be very special and we see these features in our experiment and so we cannot predict the outcome now there are some other issues so even if we knew for example all the trajectories of all the bullets that are shot in a war we could not understand what was the reason for this war and here is a movie that basically shows you how difficult it is to match a pattern. The pattern we are trying to match is an infinity sign. We're trying to match it with ellipses and with polygons. And we're going to increase the noise a little bit and we'll see how, how different is your prediction. So that shows you that small details, small changes would change your predictions dramatically. We would tend to see spurious patterns, you know, like we seem to see signs in the sky 
but scientists would think that doesn't have a meaning or we would see these spurious correlations such as number of killers as a function of traffic consumption and obviously you know if that was the case then Switzerland would be a very dangerous place besides we are of course trying always to separate good and bad risks but that's not so easy as we would think because the point clouds would be overlapping and there would always be errors of first kind and errors of second kind so there would be false alarms now you would think somebody is a terrorist but in fact he is not or you, there would be the situation where you overlook that somebody has bad intentions and this problem cannot be solved besides complex systems have limits of predictability, as we know, in fact, from weather forecasts. And this is not because we don't have enough data, even if you had an infinite amount of data. You could not predict the weather over a time period of a month or three months or so because of the physics behind this phenomenon. And this is the physics of turbulence. And we know that slightest deviations which change the outcome over time. That's called the butterfly effect. Okay? So I acknowledge that big data allows for improvements in decision making, but it's not a solution for everything. And we need to be aware of this. So if we look at these three curves. Processing power is doubling every 18 months. Data volume is doubling every 12 months. That means within just one year, we are producing as much data as in all the years before. So we are getting from a situation where we didn't have enough data to take good decisions into a situation where we can now take evidence-based decisions. That's good. But what's happening here? Suddenly, there is a gap between the data volume and the processing power. And it turns out we cannot process all the data that exists. And the gap will open up more and more and more. That means there is this problem of dark data that exists and we can never process. In other words, we might be able to look at anything, but the question is, what should we look at? And that creates a flashlight effect. <laughs> Yes, I will come back to this later on. Thank you. So the flashlight effect means that we would see some things and we would overlook other things because they're in the dark. And so when the world was fighting terrorism in the aftermath of September 11, we were overlooking the financial crisis growing. When we were focusing on fighting the financial crisis, we were overlooking the Arab Spring. And when we were looking into this, the crisis in Ukraine came up suddenly and surprisingly. And we also responded too late to Ebola, pretty late. In fact. Now, this is not just an issue that governments face. That's happening in companies too. Now, Xerox Park, for example, invented the computer mouse. They didn't get rich on it because they didn't see the value. They invented Windows 2. But again, it was Microsoft that made the money with Windows because they didn't understand that was so valuable. MP3 is another example. Or also text messaging. You know, sometimes we have the gold in our hands and we don't see its gold. And then there is this problem of systemic complexity. As we go on networking the world, we are creating new opportunities to network the world. You know, take two objects. They can be connected to build a third object. These three objects provide six possibilities to create new objects or to create objects. Then, you know, it's a, the faculty function basically that determines systemic complexity because we have combinatorial possibilities to network systems even though we don't 
do everything that could theoretically be done, we are doing a certain percentage of this. And that's enough actually to get into the situation where systemic complexity would get beyond the situation that could be fully understood with even this enormous amount of data that we produce. So basically what I'm saying is fixing the unsolved problems of our world needs a different approach. And it needs our attention to be focused on unstable systems. I've men been mentioning this already, but th let's look at this. Uh, it's not difficult to drive in a circle, you would think. But as this experiment of uh, your colleague Yuki Sugiyama is showing, you know, after some time, traffic flow mm -hmm. is breaking down. So a phantom traffic jam develops out of nothing. Now, suppose we would know everything about every single driver, you know, the entire psychology, how every person thinks, how every person feels. Could we predict this traffic jam? No, we couldn't predict it. And it doesn't even require microscopic knowledge to understand why it's happening, because we know that above a certain density, traffic flow becomes unstable. And even the slightest change in the initial condition, you couldn't even see it, would that the system break down. Of course, this slight deviation from the equilibrium state would be amplified. The next driver is responding, but with a delay. And this, uh, you now to compensate for the delay, that driver has to brake a little bit harder, the next one even harder. And so finally, after this cascade effect, cars get stopped, although no driver wants this to happen. So we're faced with systemic instability here. And systemic instability means that no matter if you have all the information, no matter you have good technology, no ha matter you have well-educated people and the very best intentions to avoid the outcome here of a traffic jam, it would happen sooner or later because it's an uncontrollable system. And the same applies to basically all the problems that we haven't managed to solve in the world. They're based on instabilities, like Unstable supply chains, you know, even managers could not stabilize the, um, the number of beer bottles in this beer game. Yeah? It's a very interesting game to play to find out that we see also stop and go flows in supply chains. And even in the world economy, in fact, you know, booms and recessions are like stop and go waves in traffic. Now, if we can, however, fix stop and go waves and traffic flows, we might also be able to fix bullwhip effects and booms and recessions. And that's what I'm saying, you know, we can fix it. But we need to think in the right way about this kind of system. Same thing with crowd disasters. Now, in many situations where crowd disasters happen, nobody wants to harm anybody. You don't need to behave in an aggressive way for people to die in a crowd disaster. Just the situation gets out of control and even hundreds of security people would not be able to stop this crowd disaster from happening if this situation is uncontrollable. We see similar phenomena in crime, and we also see it behind the tragedies of the commons, where we know that cooperation would be a favorable outcome and it would be good for everyone. But still, we have overfishing and we have other kinds of problems, like global warming, uh, like environmental exploitation, and so on. And it's because 
cooperation is unstable in a similar way as the free traffic flow in the circle is unstable. The desirable outcome is unstable and that's why bad things happen. Same thing with conflict. Yeah. If you don't believe it, uh, you might remember that some of the people you really like you sometimes get into trouble with and end up you know, having conflict even though you don't want this. Now, otherwise, we wouldn't have so many divorces. Yeah? And the same thing can happen on a regional or even international scale. The situation might just get out of control. And again, same thing with revolutions. And so there is a graph that suggests that as an economy develops, you would get eventually to a certain line where there would be um, a governance model that gives more freedom to the people. And that's probably necessary for the economy to develop further. And you could get above this line, but you now it's like it's super cold water or Basically, it's a matter of time until there is a trigger where this transition happens. That's what I believe. So, besides this, in many of these unstable behaving systems, uh, we see cascade effects. So, one event could trigger different outcomes, or the same outcome could be triggered by different events. And that happens with the delay usually, so it's very difficult to understand what's going on in complex systems and why. It could also happen that the one event triggers several other events. So if we have a local failure that may produce other failures, then the size of the damage might get bigger and bigger and bigger, as we've seen it for the financial crisis. So a local perturbation in an unstable system would eventually mess up potentially the entire system. And this is of course an experiment uh, which is more metaphorical. But that hopefully is not an experiment. No. Bankruptcy cascades as we've seen them in the aftermath of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. So hundreds of banks have failed. It cost hundreds of billions of dollars. It's a very similar phenomenon. You know? If we don't want these things to happen, we need to design systems in a different way. And we see similar things in power grids too. You know, there was a local failure on the power grid over here, but it caused blackouts all over Europe, thousands of kilometers away. You know. And uh, in some places nearby, there's still electricity, and some places very far away, there is no electricity. You know. It doesn't seem to make sense, but you know, this is how complex systems can behave. And even worse, if we have networks of networks, I mean, interdependent systems, that would make these systems potentially even more vulnerable. And we have gotten into a situation where the World Economic Forum believes that now the biggest risks are of economic and social and governance issues. Not environment, not technology. So we need to understand our society much better. So maybe we need to have a different approach. You know, we cannot solve the problems with the same kind of thinking that created them, said Albert Einstein. And I believe we are trying to solve many 21st century problems in this densely connected world with 20th century thinking. So one of our main problems, of course, is the lack of sustainability. We're consuming too much. And in order to be able you know, to go on, we have engaged in this process of globalization. That, however, 
has produced a number of other problems, such as global warming and climate change. But also, we see that many societies started to destabilize somehow. And that's interesting. Now, let's look into this public goods game that's being played over here between neighbors in a circle. And then let's add additional links to have additional interactions in the system. Now, what we find is the following, that as we increase connectivity, the cooperation level actually goes up. So we would think, oh, that's fine, perfect. You know, let's increase connectivity even more. And we get even more cooperation. And then we increase it even more, and we get, again, more cooperation. But eventually, we get beyond this point where cooperation goes down, 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 surprisingly. And we can understand it, and it probably happened in the world financial system, too, as Andy Haldane of the Bank of England diagnosed. You know, he pointed out that we had this issue of more and more densely connected financial systems, and he thinks that was one of the root causes of the financial crisis. Unfortunately, we see more social unrest, too, and actually a long list of countries. And that's pretty concerning. And basically, in order to fix these problems, many people believe that we should have global governance institutions, a world government, government basically, uh, we would need maybe <coughs> mass surveillance and armed police in order to stabilize the systems. Even though we know that it hasn't worked in the past, on the contrary. So maybe we should think about these systems in a different way to stabilize them in another way. So to overcome or mitigate these problems, we need a different systems design and operation. That's what I'm trying to say. And so let's come back to this Gordian knot that we've seen in the beginning. You know, what did Alexander the Great do? Well, he took his sword, you know, the military people understand this, and took his sword and cut the knot into pieces. This is how he solved it. You know. How do we translate that into the modern world? Well, we need to engage into decentralization. And otherwise, I believe the world will fragment into subsystems. So we better do it actively, because otherwise we would lose control. And in fact, we now see that those countries that have a federal organization, like Germany and Switzerland, are doing better than other countries like France and Spain that are more centralized. This is interesting. So basically what this suggests is as the complexity of system goes up, we need to increase the level of autonomy of control to achieve our goals. And that of course requires responsible behavior uh, of these autonomous deciding units and good education. Now, I believe together we can build a more resilient, smarter society. Now, what I try to suggest is, even if we have the most powerful information systems ever, there will always be surprises. And so, what really matters is to be prepared for surprises. So your society can handle with anything that might happen. We've had a hackathon in San Francisco to address this issue because a big earthquake could happen any day in San Francisco, Los Angeles, this area. And there were 90 people coming to this hackathon. And the interesting thing is they developed a completely new paradigm of how to respond to disaster. So this is the classical approach, you know. Like a military approach, you would gather information everywhere in the system that will go up you know, from this level to that level, from there to the top. There, 
the government would try to figure out the optimal response, then it would give out commands to this level and then to that level and so on. So the principle is do this. However, we know that you know, information um, connections might be broken, we might have informational overload, uh, information will may be contradictory or ambiguous or whatsoever. So there are all sorts of problems actually. And there's also a capacity issue. It takes about three days until government units are fully operational. But these are the critical three days. So what did these people in the Silicon Valley come up with? They came up with this system. We would have an information platform that collects actually the needs. And then people could basically join in and say, I can do this, or I can do that. I can help. And I personally believe that in a quickly changing world, politics and business becomes increasingly similar to disaster response management. That means this combination of top-down and bottom-up will be more powerful and more and more needed in order to be able to respond to these challenges more successfully. And this is the three winning projects. Amigo Cloud came up with an app for the smartphone and you could basically take pictures of a broken bridge, a destroyed house or the road that was not operational anymore, anything, you could annotate it. And whenever you, your smartphone would have connectivity again, it would send this information, it would upload it to some information platform that informs the government, the disaster response team, but everyone else too, okay? Now, of course, electricity might be down. Communication might be down too, but uh, now we have uh, ad hoc networks, you know, fire chat, like peer-to-peer -peer communication systems with your smartphones. So the smartphones could talk to each other even if the centralized infrastructure is not working anymore. But we need electricity, of course, otherwise after a few hours your smartphone would not be operational anymore. So Charge Beacon proposed to have this local autonomous station to charge your smartphones using solar panels. You know, that would also be meeting points for people in the neighborhood. So they would talk to each other. What's the situation? You know, how can we respond? What can we do? And then once your smartphones work, you can also use the Helping Hands app. That was the third award-winning solution. And basically here you could say, I need some help for my grandmother. I need some baby food. I need this, I need that. And other people in the neighborhood could respond and say, you know, I can help you with this. I, I still have some, have some stuff in the cellar. I, I'm happy to support you with this. And in disasters, of course, people help each other. Just it's a coordination issue. So having these three solutions in combination takes a lot of load from the government and disaster response team, they can focus on the most difficult question. Now they get rid of a lot of things that can be solved locally in the neighborhood. So what we need is basically tools to help people to help themselves. Now, I've talked about big data and the limitations. And now I'd like to announce a different approach, a new a scientific a data-driven approach based on smart data. And that's enabled by a new kind of technology. It's called the Internet of Things or Internet of Everything. So very soon you will be able to measure anything in our environment, not just the physical and biological and whatever environment, anything we think of, social, our society, our economy, everything in real time. Now, how should we use these data? Well, we could try to collect them all in one place and save them forever, you know, as the big data approach su suggests. However, I propose a different kind of approach. 
uh, the CERN approach. Now, CERN is the biggest civic um, big data infrastructure that exists in the world. But they're throwing away 99.9% .9 of their data immediately. Because they could never evaluate all these data. So you're just keeping those data that they believe are important to answer a certain question. Like, is this theoretical hypothesis right or is it wrong? Is this theory right or that theory right? And these theories have implications in terms of the patterns that you expect to see. And they're looking for these patterns and they're not interested in other patterns. So it's a tailored measurement approach, you know. And this is what we can actually set up now. And I'd like to invite you to participate in this, you know. I'd love to see some Japanese developer hubs to develop a planetary nervous system as a citizen web, as a participatory system. And that's actually not as difficult as you would think, because all it takes is you and your smartphones, because we can connect all these smartphones to create a global measurement system. They just need to talk to each other, right? Every smartphone has about 10, 15 sensors. So we can do a lot of measurements with these smartphones. Actually, I don't use my phone to make phone calls. Uh, for example, we can measure acceleration. And with this, we can come up with a collective earthquake sensing and warning up. Right? If one smartphone shakes, and it could be me riding a mountain bike, if all our smartphones shake, you know, that would be an earthquake. So all the people in my contact list, my friends, my colleagues, should be warned. And that could be done automatically by our smartphones talking to each other. But it's important, I believe, that we would build a system that we can trust. And for this, I propose that we would have a control panel that allows us to decide which of those different sensors to use just for our own measurements, and which of these measurements to share with other people. What we also do is we don't use the microphone as a microphone, but we degrade it to measure just noise. We don't want to spy on what you're saying. Yeah? And then what we want to have in the future too is <coughs> something like an open data store where all the personal data that are produced about you would be sent and there you could basically say okay i am happy to share my consumption data with companies because i want to get some personal offers i'm happy to share my social data with my friends and i'm happy to share my medical data with my doctor and maybe there's some data that I don't want to share with anyone. But in, in principle, you know, that would increase the level of trust a lot. So I'd like to encourage you to do this together. Now, to build a participatory system very similar to Linux or Wikipedia or OpenStreetMap. Now, we could produce an open big data stream for everyone. So the principle would be give and take. You can take data from the system for your own use, for your own purposes. But for the system to work well, you should give back data, of course. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Same thing with source codes that we need to do the measurement. There would be many different measurement protocols. You know, my team could just come up with 10 or 20 of these. But you would have other ideas. Yeah, you would download these codes, you would modify the code, you would adjust it to what you want to do, you would give it back so other people can take it, modify it, and so on. So quickly, you know, we have a lot of different possibilities. Uh, there will be exponential innovation. And with a micropayment system on top, everyone could use this to establish an own business. Just you know, remember what I was saying before, 50% of people will lose their classical jobs. So we need to create new jobs, and that would be the data on which we would build 
these new jobs. You know, you could have your consultancy, you could come up with your own services, you could come up with your own products, you could produce these products at home, and so on. So that would unleash the power of information, that would unleash a lot of economic value. And this platform would help you to collaborate with others. So together we would create a really powerful and quickly growing information, innovation, and production ecosystem. The more is being produced, the more becomes possible to produce. Now here we are back to the combinatorial principle, but this is going to unleash the power of your economy. And participation is really important for this. You know, if we talk about geostrategic issues, then what is important is that the economy of your country is, is running well that you're using all the power of all the intelligent people in your country. And in order to have this, you know, we need to have a participatory system. So if set up well, enabling users, customers, and citizens will lead to better services, better products, better businesses, better neighborhoods, smarter cities, and smarter societies. We just need to build it in a way that would help to coordinate activities. We don't want social chaos, you know? And so the question is, how do you have to build it so it would work well? You could do a lot of things with the planetary nervous system, real-time measurement, uh, increase awareness, come up with global system science, better understanding of systems, self-organizing system and collective intelligence. And we'll go a little bit into this. So create awareness of our situation. Very important. So we could build new compasses for decision makers that measure not just GDP per capita and many other things, but also things you can't see, like social capital, reputation, trust, solidarity, compliance, happiness. We could map resources, and if you use them, we could map crisis. And we could also actually map our globe in 3D using the pictures that are out there. And of course, everyone is uploading pictures. Now, these, these are the positions of all the people who took pictures, and this is the positions where the cameras were pointing to. And I see you can make a 3D reconstruction from your office desk, basically. So that's kind of a crowdsourcing approach, very powerful. So besides this, besides mapping the world, we can actually come up with science that allows us to understand systems, you know, models that are predictive to a certain extent. So to basically come up with models of the world, and we, we have actually done this in many cases, so pedestrian models, traffic models, uh, models for the economy, models for opinion information, for um, coordination and the formation of behavioral conventions, models for cooperation, for the spreading of crime, for the evolution of moral behavior, evolution of social preferences, of social norms, of conflict, the spreading of conflict, spreading of epidemics, you know. So this is just work we've done in our own team. We have a much better understanding of all these things by now and all the instabilities that I've been talking about, when they happen, why they happen, and so on. Now, even more importantly, complex designs allows us to use the hidden forces behind the self-organization phenomena to our advantage. It's like in Asian martial arts, and if you understand the forces, you can use them for you. And as in physics, and engineering, you know, we can use social forces for us. We just need to understand how they work. We shouldn't fight these social forces, you know. We should understand them. And then a minimally invasive approach would create the outcomes that we like. I will give you some examples. So the main point here is if you understand the system, you would know how to introduce feedback loops in order to that the system self-organize in the way you like it to happen. 
it's like magic, you know. The system itself would create the structure, the properties, and the functionality that you'd like to have. If you just have the right kind of feedback, the right kind of interaction in the system, it all happens by itself, like magic. And how to figure out basically what kind of interaction and feedback loops you need? Well, this is actually where the living earth simulator would come in, or interactive virtual worlds. You know, experimental platforms that allow you to test different mechanisms, or even interactive games. Moreover, I think we need to learn to appreciate the value of different cultures a lot more. Culture is something that is largely invisible, like, you know, 10% of it you can see like the tip of the iceberg, 90% of it, you know, we don't see, we don't hear, we cannot even express in words. But culture is based on a lot of mechanisms that decide about the success and failure in our society. Now, just assume we would learn to make these rules explicit and to use them. Uh, we could combine the success principles of different cultures with each other. How much more successful could we be? So the solution to the world's problem is not that one culture dominates the entire world. On the contrary, you know, we need to protect socioeconomic diversity in the same way as we've learned to protect biodiversity. This is highly important to be successful in the future, to learn how to create systems that would use the success principles of all these different countries. So all cultures are important. Now, 300 years after the invention of the invisible hand, I believe that now finally we can make it work because we have now the measurement infrastructure that allows it to happen, the Internet of Things. Here's an example. Uh, I told you sub and go waves happen because of an unstable dynamics, but we can fix it. We, at the moment, I'm just simulating the problem to show you that we have models that allow us to understand the problem that we've seen before in the experiment. And then, however, we'll try to change the system. Yeah? But let us first see what is actually the reason for the stop and go wave. So yeah. it turns out that there is an on-ramp, and some vehicles are trying to get on the freeway. That produces small disruptions. These disruptions are amplified. It causes a domino effect. And in the end, we have stop and go waves. But now assume we equip those cars with radar sensors that measure distances and relative velocities. And we would use this to drive these cars automatically. Uh, as you can see, after a short time, we can get rid of the traffic jam. Because we have managed to stabilize the flow and increase the capacity by changing the interactions. We call this mechanism design. So observing this wouldn't help you we would just see it happen. But understanding the reason allows you to change the interactions in a way that would avoid the problem. And that requires real-time data, real-time feedback. We've done a similar thing for urban traffic flows. And what we've done is we've changed from a system which was top-down control, so a traffic center that collects all the data in the entire city and then tries to come up with an optimal control, but because it's an NP-hard optimization problem that cannot be done in real time, so you need to come up with an approximate solution, right? And then, like a benevolent dictator, this solution is implemented in the entire city. Now, it turns out that going to a different approach where we have the traffic flows control the traffic lights would lead to a dramatically increased performance, would reduce waiting times a lot for all the participants of the system. 
and not just uh, motorized transit, but also public transport, pedestrian, cyclists, and we would be good for the environment too. So that, you know, going from top down to bottom up can be superior in certain kinds of systems. You know, some systems can be optimized nicely in a top down way. But if you have an anti-hard optimization problem uh, in a system that's changing quickly, that's hardly predictable and complex, then bottom-up can come up with flexible, adaptive, locally fitting solutions that are superior because no centralized system could do it for you. So again, the combination of top-down and bottom-up, you, know, you need to know when do you do what and how to combine it uh, will give you the best possible outcomes. And I, I believe we could also overcome recessions by creating something like a traffic assistance system for our world economy. You know, supply chains or just material flows in, in fact, and uh, we could basically model them and we could stabilize them too. So the main point here is that we need to pay more attention to the external effects of what everyone is doing, be it people or companies. We call this externalities. And if we do it in the right way, then we can make the invisible hand work. So the question is, if we can build a system system for traffic, could we build a system system for social coordination, social cooperation too? I would turn this situation into that situation. I would turn a downward spiral, as we are often seeing it, into an upward spiral. And in fact, Eleanor Ostrom got a Nobel Prize for this. You know. She made empirical studies showing that self-governance can work given proper design principles. So again, the mechanisms applied in the system are the crucial thing. So the cooperation problem, you know, social dilemmas are really old. You know, since the beginning of humanity, they have been around. They've always been free riders, and that was a problem for a social system. And for a social system to succeed, it needs to overcome these problems. Or take the stack hunt game. You know, can either everyone hunts rabbits, or we cooperate to hunt a stack. So another cooperation problem. And there are a number of decentralized mechanisms to promote cooperation. Yeah? And there can be found in all countries in the world. Each culture might have different mechanisms applied. But every culture has such kind of mechanisms. And basically, what's happening here is these mechanisms are changing the social dilemma situation into another kind of situation that allows cooperation to happen. And one of these mechanisms is direct reciprocity. So, you know, friendship, contracts, whatever. So, one, we help each other. But there are also mechanisms of indirect, uh, other mechanisms such as peer punishment as it's the basis of social norms. Now, interestingly enough, we don't have to punish in order for cooperation to happen. Again, we've done experiments in our lab, and we found out that actually competition is good between groups. And the other thing that we found out is that altruistic signaling would be superior to costly punishment. So this is quite interesting. And there's again another mechanism that is very interesting, which is merit-based matching. So if the more cooperative individuals or companies are matched with more cooperative individuals or companies, that would not only increase the level of cooperation, it would also shift the system towards more cooperation because this creates additional stationary solutions. And you see, in that game, basically, the stable solution would be no cooperation at all. 
cooperation would be favorable, but it's unstable. Now, with merit-based matching, you have two additional solutions. If you just push the system above this blue line, because that's an unstable solution, the system will be drifting towards this stable solution, which is a high level of cooperation. So this is extremely exciting. You could say, you know, those people or companies that give more will earn more. So called low is a testing or Low, low is a bad currency system. Um, <coughs> this, yes. This, this is the level of cooperation. Or little one. Yeah. Or little one. Yeah. What is the definition of the low? Oops. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, no problem. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the definition of what? The level of cooperation? Yes, yes the definition of the, uh, uh, yes. that. That's just the proportion of people who would cooperate. Okay, so I, I think uh, so the result is uh, it depends on the. Uh, density, it's kind of density of the society. If the, if the huge number of the people is a, in the system, it is very difficult to cooperate. So that kind of effect uh, is built in your analysis? Uh, it, it doesn't have so much to do actually with the density of people. Oh, really? No. So you normalize something like that. Something. So, uh, the, the, the issue is that, that here, basically, we, we form groups of a certain size and huh. say, okay, so and so many people perform the social dilemma game together or the common goods game. Yeah? And the size of this group might matter for the outcome. But um, in principle, you know, we could split the, the creation of the public good into sufficiently many small groups that are created in this way. No? Now, another interesting point is a classical in our economy. Um, there is this efficiency and quality of trade-off. So what most economies are doing is either you have more equality and less efficiency of your economy, or you have more efficiency and less equality. Now, it turns out in our experiments that this mechanism is bringing it together so you can have high efficiency and, and more equality. So I'm getting towards uh, the end eventually. So I believe we're now entering an era of social inspired technologies. We will learn to find mechanisms that would do a lot of tricks for us, that would uh, basically organize our society like magic based on the principle of self-organization. Reputation mechanisms are some of these mechanisms uh, that can be used for this. It turns out to be good actually for both sides, both sellers and consumers. Consumers uh, get higher quality, sellers could take a higher price. But I think we need to have a multi-dimensional incentive system. You know? Like um, our, our body could not live on one kind of substance, like water or air. You know, we need a lot of different things for our body to run well. And same thing for the economy. So why should just one quantity like money be enough for the economy to work well? I personally believe we need to have a multidimensional finance system, a multidimensional incentive system. And we need to engage into supporting collective intelligence to bring the best ideas of many minds together. Now, there's some interesting thing to learn from the Netflix Prize. If you go to Wikipedia, we learn about, a lot about this. So here, the, the challenge was to predict the taste of video uh, watching people. And it turned out to be much more difficult, even using a big data approach than you would see. And you could win a million dollars there were hundreds of teams that came up with thousands of solutions, um, and none of them solved the challenge within two years' time. There was one team, though, uh, that was always leading. And one day, the boss of this team walked in and said, hey, guys, come on, shall we do something else again after two years' time? I said, OK, then, and, uh, then we have to do it in a different way. And what they did is they basically teamed up with other teams that had worse solutions. 
and they were just averaging over those predictions. And they would think, okay, if you average the best prediction with others, that would create worse predictions. But the contrary was the case. It was better, and it was the winning solution. So what we learn here is diversity wins, not the best. And in fact, it turns out um, that uh, diversity is, is quite useful also for innovation, and in particular also for economic progress. This is what this paper in Science shows, actually, that the most developed economies are the most differentiated, the most diverse economies. Okay? The problem, though, is that we have difficulties to deal with diversity. Yeah? So this is what we need to engage in. We need to have tools supporting us in handling this diversity and turning it into an advantage. Now, as I said, combining good solutions from different cultural backgrounds, for example. And this is actually what uh, social technologies would do, or something that we could also call digital assistance. You know? It's like a guide that would tell you, okay, this is how this culture works, you know, how people think, why they're doing things in this way, and actually, if you would uh, engage into this with that person or company, that would create benefits for both sides. So this kind of system would, would help us to avoid lose-lose situations, protect us from exploitation, could help us to turn win-lose situations into win-win situations, make the best out of win-win situations. So this is the kind of technologies that we should be thinking of for the future. And in fact, we can create new value too. In Europe, we have a fairy tale that was about uh, turning straw into gold. And in fact, we, we can do such a thing. We don't even need straw for this. You know? We can just turn nothing into gold. You know, digits, digits, in fact. You know? Theories and ones. And Bitcoin has shown how to do this. And uh, it's even running on other people's computers. You know? <laughs> and what turns out is that it also became more valuable than, than gold at some times. But if you want to turn data into value, we need to understand the character of information. Yeah? Uh, some people think, OK, we should lock it somewhere and not shared with other people, and not, as we would do it with gold and other valuable materials. But data has a different kind of nature. You know, it's actually a perishable good, so it would lose value very quickly. You know, outdated information is like cold coffee. Nobody is interested in this, right? And I believe data will not be valuable for long. That's the bad news, in a sense. And in fact, we can see that already. I mean, you can't earn much money with music these days. And Spotify, you know, basically can listen to a song for almost no money. And we will see that in all data-driven areas, because, as I said before, every year we're producing as much data as in the entire history of humankind. I mean, it's, it's, it'll be an abundance of data. And sooner or later, data will be cheap. You know? The value will be created with information filters that help you to get orientation in this data deluge. So why don't we open up data as much as we can you know, to create value for as many people and companies as possible? Um, and the main point here is information is not material. We don't have to take away something from others to get more. In fact, we can have all as much information as we like. We can share it as often as we like if we just build the systems in the right way. So you now we should build a catalyst that's catalyzing value as we share. And I was trying to find a picture that's giving you the idea how it works. You know. Oh, we're just in Easter time, you know, so this is kind of the, 
the animal standing for Easter, you know. But what often happens is, oh, suddenly there are two of them, you know. And and then there's three. Now this is something that doesn't happen by itself, you know. No company can do it by itself. You know? It needs interaction, obviously. Uh, oh, suddenly there are five of them, and then there are eight, and so on. So basically, you know, you have this Fibonacci system over here, and it produces exponential growth rather than linear growth. So a classical innovation approach produces linear innovation. You, know, you produce a new car every two years, for example, a new software release every so and so many years. This is linear innovation. You know, creating an information ecosystem allows you to create exponential innovation. You could create exponentially increasing value. You know, just have to use information the right way. And so we must learn to share information, to open up data, to create benefits. So. These are some of the ideas that makes it die. Having more data is always better. Data is objective. More knowledge means more control. More intelligence is better. Control can replace trust. And diversity is our problem. Yeah, so I, as I said, these are misunderstandings, even though it sounds very plausible. And these are the core principles for the economy 4.0 in the smart digital society. You know, we need to build this planetary nervous system together. We should consider externalities in our decisions. We should create a multidimensional finance system, social information technologies, these digital assistants, and collective intelligence. Rather, I think it's superior to super intelligence if we learn how to do this. And interestingly enough, all of this can be based on a distributed approach, which is a very important precondition for a resilient society. Yeah? And I believe the countries implementing these new organization principles first will be leading in the 21st century. And I'm closing with this slide. I believe that finally, now, everything comes together. This is really exciting. Yeah? Science, politics, business, society, and if you want, even religion, or at least ethics. You know? If we engage in these self organizing systems enabled by the Internet of Things and complexity science, we'll have massively increased efficiency, we'll have self organizing, self improving systems, we'll have the democratic principle of participation implemented. We'll have individual autonomy of decision making, free entrepreneurial activity in markets. But we would consider externalities in our decision making, both individuals and companies and countries. And that would make sure that we would behave in an other regarding and fair way, that we would improve our environment and that we would get into a situation where cooperation would flourish and conflict would be reduced. So what are we waiting for? Get ready. Let's make the magic happen together. Thank you.